Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Backyard Bounty. I'm your host, Nicole, and today I'm joined by Dr. Tammy Horn Potter, who is the author of three books, The Kentucky State Apiarist for the Kentucky State uh, Department of Agriculture, as well as the board uh, of the Honeybee Health Coalition, Eastern Apiculture Society, Foundation for the Preservation of Honeybees, and Project Apis M. And today we are going to talk about the history of beekeeping in North America. And Tammy, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, I'm really excited to have you on the show. I've I've been trying to find somebody to talk about the history of beekeeping for a while. Um, it's actually been a challenge. And through a series of events, I was able to uh, come across your fantastic book that you have on the history of beekeeping. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk about this this topic with you today. But uh, before we get into that, can you kind of give us a little bit more about your background and your beekeeping? I know as we were talking before the show, you've got a lot going on. Oh, well, I am. I, I think many people have heard me talk about how I, when I was a, an English professor, I, uh, I took the summer off to, to help my grandfather uh, with his beehives. And before that, I was determined never to do science, agriculture, or math in my life. <laughs> I, had, I had chosen a career path that was determined, you know, to stay very linear and to stay away from all three of those endeavors. And of course, now I sit before you and I do all three, typically every single day, and I, and I love it. Uh, so I'm a, an example of somebody whose hobby became a career through dog-legged fashion. Um, but I think uh, you had asked about my first book, and I wrote Bees in America uh, starting in 2002, it, and basically it was the book that I wanted to find, and I couldn't find it anywhere. Because as an English professor, I was um, enthralled with the way that uh, we see the honeybee used in so many of our cultural uh, interactions and in our music and in our art. And, and so I wanted to have, um, it, that, that's how that first book started. Um, it wasn't planned. Um, I, it was, it's very chronological. Um, it starts in the 1600s and moves right up to uh, 2004 uh, when I finished. Um, and, and I've been surprised pleasantly surprised at, in many ways, how current it remains. Um, I think for many of the values in our society, uh, it, it goes back to those early symbols that we used with honeybees where we associate values such as thrift and hard work with, with being like a honeybee. And if, if somebody isn't, you know, pulling their fair share, as we say, we tend to call them a lazy drone, which was, you know, at the time in the 1600s, um, you know, we didn't quite understand what was going on in the bee biology of that. Um, but, you know, we still have these, uh, we, those, those still values and that association that we make with honeybees is still quite prevalent. And, um, you know, so that, that's, that's been the, the surprise about the book is that I think it's still relevant, maybe even more so. Here we are in 2021, and we have more people unemployed than I can remember in my working career. And of course, we know that this isn't because people are lazy or people are, are uh, not saving enough or they haven't been thrifty or anything like that. I think as a country, we're in a better position to understand the dynamics that, that a virus can have on our economy. So this to me is, is you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity for our country to begin to kind of separate um, what we bring to our notions of, um, you know, the relief programs and, you know, stimulus programs and things like that. 
Um, it, it's a way, I think, of having a more enlightened discussion than falling back on our associations about what work is and, and who should sure. be doing it and, sure. and, and who should receive help, you know, and who should give help. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, I, I guess I really it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> But to yeah, that me, was, oh, <laughs> apparently there's sure a little bit of a lag. I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. I just, um, to me, it seems like one of the things that I hear in Washington, D.C., um, you know, some of the, the conversations about these issues of poverty and, and uh, social welfare and uh, you know, all of these kinds of, of discussions, um, I think, have been, whether we like it or not, we've been imprinted by our value system that we associate with honeybees. And, and, it, and it's neither Democrat nor Republican. It's neither left or right. You know, it just goes four centuries back, and we've forgotten that. Sure. I think that, you know, that brings up a lot of really good points. You know, there is um, a lot to say about the societal structure of the honeybee colony. Um, a lot of really good lessons that we can take from that. And also a lot of um, misunderstandings and, and mystery when it comes to, to bees and the history of beekeeping. And I know that as I've been involved in beekeeping for the time that I have, there's a lot of, um, a lot of misunderstanding. So um, could we maybe talk about the oh, beginning sure. of beekeeping in America? Because I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that honeybees actually are not a, a native species to North America. That's correct. It's become a naturalized species um, mm -hmm. since, since mm -hmm. the early 1600s. And of course, because of the forestry practices that were in place already by the Native American cultures, you know, there were, there were, um, it was a good environment for honeybees to thrive. Uh, you know, there were black gum trees that, you know, were standing. And so honeybees could swarm into those and, um, and do very well. Of course, at this point in time, um, th there weren't uh, parasites, that many parasites that were um, a, a big issue with, with the honeybee, uh, you know, as, as far as I'm thinking of varroa mites, which are impacting current honeybee hives now. Um, but those, weren't, you know, that's a 20th century problem, not a, not an early 17th century problem. Um, so, you know, honeybees did very well. In fact, you know, I like to quote a scholar, Ann Cooperman, who says, honeybees did better than the settlers did. You know, the settlers were dying off, you know, 50% rates, but honeybees were doing quite well. I mean, there were, there was plenty of, of forage and, um, uh, Plenty of, of, of standing trees so that they could swarm, and um, they they established themselves and naturalized themselves quite rapidly. Um, they would often move in advance or, or concurrent. You know, uh, migration happened either by swarming on the bees' part, or settlers were often taking them with them. Um, but but that is true. Um, that's a big surprise for many people. It has become a divisive topic uh, among current um, people who are pro-pollinators uh, because there's this uh, question if, you know, do we consider honeybees as invasive? Um, mm -hmm. But, <clears throat> you know, with, with our industrial agriculture being what it is and, and how many people that we feed, not just in the United States, but around the world, you know, our industrial agriculture, our specialty crops depend upon pollinators, a diverse mm -hmm. set of pollinators. In other words, I, I wouldn't, <clears throat> I think if anything, what I, um, I would never be an either or person. You know, I think we need all of the species that our country can sustainably take care of uh, in order to provide food for not just our citizens, but also in, in international countries. So what did the very first uh, colonies look like? How did they bring them over? You know, did they keep them in 
hives or in some sort of a special, you know, transportation colony or something. And and then when did the Langstroth hive come into play? Is that what the settlers used or did they use skeps or something different? Uh, so skeps, of course, were quite popular in, in Germany and in Europe, in Ireland especially. Uh, places, it's, you know, our hive technology is determined by the environment. And so places that have grasses and, you know, uh, those, um, you know, the, so the skep is something that is, is popular with the European countries. Um, we don't start having bees in log trunks, really, in, in, unless you are in Russia. You know, uh, Ufa, Russia, of course, is the site of the 2022 Apomondia, and they are going to focus on, on forest-based beekeeping. Um, but, you know, they have those huge forests there um, that, are, again, made really good habitat for healthy colonies. Uh, but the, the English settlers were much more accustomed to the skeps. And the skeps have a couple of advantages. Um, a, you could build them from your environment, the grasses around you. Um, they weren't expensive to build. Um, uh, B, you could carry them from town to town if you needed to. Not that you would want to, because, of course, <laughs> they, they are stinging insects. But, but if you had to, you know, they could be transported. And so that's what the um, guess is, is that, you know, skeps were, were brought into the hold of the ship and then, you know, could, you know, stay out of the the way of, of other horses and, and other livestock that was being transported across, uh, you know, the, the ocean. Um, so we think skeps were the, the primary mode of, of transporting bees. And then once they got to, the, to North America, then they started uh, branching out by having the bee gums, the tree gums that uh, you see in, in my part of the, of the state. Uh, there are still beekeepers who keep hives in bee gums. Um, really? This is really? not allowed in most states. In fact, there are laws against this because you cannot move, remove the frames to check for American fowl brood. But in our state, there's not a law against it. And so in the eastern part of the state, of course, it's the Appalachians, um, there are some beekeepers who, who, you know, a swarm is moved in to um, a, a huge tree, and so they'll just cut it and keep it. Um, you had asked about the Langstroth hive, and uh, that comes into existence in the 1850s. Uh, so it's it's later, uh, approximately a good you know 100 plus years later. Um, and again, what makes that hive um, such a, a a gift to beekeepers is that. It is a movable frame hive. Um, Langstroth's genius was figuring out that you know bees needed a, a very precise amount of distance between the frames so that they could build out the beeswax foam, which of course beeswax is going to do three things, right? It you know it it holds the brood and it holds the the nutritional needs of the colony, the pollen which becomes bee bread and the, the nectar, which becomes honey. But then it's also the dance floor. So the bees need room to, to communicate, you know, mm -hmm. so that, you know, that space between the frames is called bee space. And, and um, Langstroth figured that out. And that if, if he just kept his frames at, in that appropriate amount of bee space, and they could provide all of those needs to the colony, but the beekeeper could also come along and make sure to man help manage the colony, check to see if it had a queen, if it needs a queen, check to see if the bees need more pollen, you know, which is what I'm doing this time of year. Um, on these days when it's like 40 or 50 degrees and I can get into the hive very quickly and see how they're doing, make sure that they have enough honey to get through this last stretch of winter. Um, that's the brilliance of the Langstroth movable frame hive. 
Yeah, I think it's a, yeah. it would have been really interesting to be there and uh, to watch him as he kind of figured out how to build this perfect hive or or <laughs> at least as perfect as you can for a man-made hive that we still use today. I think that um, th there had to have been so much observation and science involved. I, I can't even imagine. He, there's, he, of course, he was a prolific writer. He was a, a mm -hmm. trained um, pastor. And so he was accustomed to writing. And he says that he just yelled Eureka and then <laughs> ran through the streets. <laughs> he was thrilled. He knew immediately that he had, he, he that he, he, he understood. Um, and so uh, he, he writes about that moment and it's always a, a great pleasure uh, to see people when they choose to enact his life uh, because he was a, a very charismatic person. He was a very kind person, um, you know, as a teacher, um, you know, uh, you know, students can sometimes be quite mischievous. They were never <laughs> mischievous uh, to, 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 to Mr. Langstra. They were always very respectful to him because he was so kind. Um, so he's quite a hero uh, for beekeepers. And then I think since we're talking about the Langstra Hive, we should also mention uh, that there were three other inventions in the 19th century. All four of these inventions are still used in the beekeeping industry today, right? So we have the Langstroth hive, the movable frame hive, right? That was the crucial one uh, because prior to that, the beekeepers had to destroy the, you know, the comb, they had to destroy the hive. They would often uh, let the weaker one try to survive the winter and, and you know, kill the heavy one so that they could get their, their honey and their beeswax. Um, but the movable frame hive made it possible to provide maintenance and also at the same time generate honey production and, and at the same time also move them too. So pollination becomes a real possibility. Um, so the Langstroth hive, that's crucial. That's, that's, that's the, the turning point when it doesn't just become a backyard hobby, it becomes possible to be a commercial beekeeper. But the second um, invention, and this is not in any order because we all, we need them all for, uh, but the other invention was the smoker, the bellow smoker. Uh, Moses Quimby is typically credited with, with that, with the design that becomes more popular, but you will see in a fascinating drawings from the Ukraine and Russia, uh, the, the, the tree people smoking pipes, you know, to calm the bees, right? Like that's what they would do instead of having a smoker. But in the United States, we developed a smoker that has a bellows and is, um, you know, it doesn't go out Hope if you know what you're doing. <laughs> Sometimes there's a little bit of the magic arts there that you have to, <laughs> yeah. you have to learn. Yeah. Um, but um, so we have a smoker. Um, the extractor, honey extractor is also designed then. I think that that was designed in Germany. Uh, but, but the you know, United States quickly adopted that uh, engineering. And, and so we, we still use that. Um, and then the foundation maker. Really? You know, that's, I think, a U.S. invention. And so uh, in, in the process of being able to, to make beeswax foundation easy and easily and cheaply, you know, then beekeepers can make frames with that beeswax foundation and really jumpstart their honey production. You know, bees are no longer having to construct that, that beeswax because the beekeeper is providing that foundation. And, you know, it is, it is enormous, enormously time intensive and, and resource intensive for a colony to produce beeswax. So when, when that foundation press 
uh, comes into being, beekeepers can just take off and go then. And, and the commercial honey industry then is, is set to go in the 19th century. And then there's some other jumps in progress. Uh, queen production towards the end of the 19th century becomes a, a real skill and art as it continues until today. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you know uh, the book. Um, uh, here, I say this, and now I've, I've lost the title of it. But, but Douglas Wynott's Following the Bloom uh, mm -hmm. is about a migratory beekeepers. And I think, Interesting. don't hold me to this, but I think it was written in 1990, and it was re-released in 2005, maybe. Um, and, and what he discusses... Other people have always have also said it too, but uh, what I think he does such a good job of, of discussing is the role of transportation, and and how transportation helps um, set up uh, this model of of following a migratory triangle, if you will. Uh, so, for instance, commercial beekeepers would send their bees on trains, you know. And this had some real mixed af effects. <laughs> I mean, you know, because if, if a train was stopped in the middle of the Mojave Desert, you know, then you could have a real mess on your hands. You know, by the time the train finally arrived in the station um, where the beekeeper was supposed to pick up his live bees. Um, there are some great pictures, early 1900s. Uh, beekeepers just determined to, to, to do some pollination. And so they have their hives on a horse drawn wagon. Well, you think about how, how much you have to work with a horse, you know, to, to, so that it can handle that. Um, sure. You know, and, sure. and so, so Douglas Wynott's point is that, you know, uh, semis, you know, flatbed trailers make, make an industrial countryside, agricultural countryside possible because you can load those hives on pallets with a forklift on the back of a semi, you know, throw a net over them and, and then away they can go. And you have, you're able to get pollination to those specialty crops when they need it. And then keep following the bloom, you know, Sure. So it's February the 5th right now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 2.5 million hives maybe or not that many, but, you know, a good, I'd say a good million are, are over there in the Central Valley in California working almonds, you know. And when the almond bloom is done, then they'll move right up to cherries or, you know, the, in Washington State or apples, they'll move. You know, they'll move someplace and then they'll end up in South Dakota on clover uh, to spend the summer. And all of that happens because we have we have good infrastructure in terms of our transportation, our national transportation. We have interstates, uh, we have forklifts, we have semis, um, and uh, that makes the United States very unusual. You know, sure. our our federal government invests in good transportation, not just for beekeepers, obviously, but we benefit. Our food system benefits because of that. Mm -hmm. So obviously, these are things that are vastly different from beekeeping back in the day. <laughs> so um, you mentioned that the uh, the smoker was a, a later invention. How and I, I don't know if this is well documented, but how do beekeeping practices differ um, from the 1600s to today other than, you know, of course, what you've already touched on? So, uh, you know, in the 1600s, uh, a lot of the beekeeping was, was done by women, you know. Um, really? Deputy wives is what the, is what they were called. There was a there was an actual designation because, you know, if you think about where the settlements were, 
it, you know, they were right at the coastline. And so many men were sailors. You know, they would have to leave their home for, for months, you know, sometimes half a year. That was not unusual. And so, it, you know, their wives had legal authority uh, to make decisions, you know, to, to make purchases. But they also had, you know, the responsibility of providing food every day for the kids. And, and you know, and so, you know, they, along with the chickens, hives and chickens were the domain quite often of the good wife. You know, there was a title. Um, and of course, you know, <laughs> You know, as somebody who didn't marry until I was 45, you know, we're, we're, I'm co quite conscious of, you know, the fact that, you know, there was this immense pressure on a woman to be a good wife. Like, that's what you were supposed to do. But, you know, that was, you know, taking care of the hives was part of your responsibility. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a skill that was gender determined, like other agricultural skills could sure. be. I mean, you know, this was a, a, a you know, in fact, I, I write in my second book, which is all about women and bees. I write about the Irish saint, Saint Gomnat, and in Gaelic, that means Deborah, which is Hebrew for bee. And Saint Gomnat was the beekeeper. And in her uh, particular um, nunnery, uh, that's what they, they did, um, you know. In her convent, uh, they took care of bees. And so they provided honey for uh, people during times of illness. And when their convent was threatened by Vikings, then they took the skeps and they dropped them right on top of the Vikings' heads <laughs> and defended their, their convent. You know, this is, you know, this, of course, is the myth I have you know, have yet to see it dramatized, but, um, you know, so, so my point here is that, is that women kept bees in the 1600s. And that, like I said, it's, it wasn't a gendered agricultural activity, but because they were using skeps and, and, you know, they were using log gums, you know, these, um, these trees that would decay from the inside out, providing a very suitable habitat for a swarm. Um, you know, there was only so much that they could do. And, and if, a, and if a, an apiary came down with something like American fowl brood, it would wipe through an apiary. There was no management whatsoever when it came to diseases or wax moth. That's, that was another occurrence. Um, so there could be problems, I guess, is the point. But it was absolutely, you know, having a couple of stalks of bees were, were uh, quite critical because when you think about it, you know, un until, until the colonies became a nation, there was no national currency. And so honey and beeswax had value, real, real bartering value sure. um, in, in this kind of uh, economy that depended upon you know, trading, um, you know, I mean, we had, we had Spanish currency, we had French currency, we had English currency, Native American currency, you know, all of the, we had a, just a plethora, you know, the Dutch had their own currency, you know, so there was an enormous amount of different types of coins um, being floating around in those early colonies. So, you know, to have to have access to honey and, and beeswax, beeswax was was almost more important than honey. Really? You know, because it was stable. You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't leak. You know, you can, but you you need you always needed things to waterproof. You know, um, you you always needed light. You know, something to start a fire with. Um, you know, so and it wasn't nearly. You know, beeswax wasn't nearly as as um, what's the word, you know, compared to bear tallow, which would be what many people would use to light their cabins and things like that. Bear tallow was very um, unpleasant smelling. Hmm. And so beeswax was hmm. quite pleasant smelling. And so, you know, to be able to make candles um, is, it was a, you know, it was not underestimated, uh, you know, the, the, the importance of, 
having a couple of beehives that that increased your um you know when you're living so close to the land like that like they were doing in the 1600s you know that would help mm-hmm. you know that, that that becomes part of your buffer zone sure was there a certain um societal class that had beehives or were were they kind of um you know, kept by everybody. And then also, um, do you know what, what race of bees were here originally? So what the specialists have said at the time that I was writing Bees in America, now, mind you, there has been so much more done with DNA analysis since then. Um, So I'll just leave that there, that there may be room for correction in Bees in America. But, but the, the, Bees that were initially brought to the states seem to have come from um, like a subspecies. Uh, we call it the German black bee. Um, it, it was not, you know, this darling of the American beekeeping industry right now of the Italians, you know, the Italian honeybees, which is right. um, that right. was not the predominant species that, that was brought over. That didn't come over until um, and it wasn't adopted readily until after the Civil War. Um, so um, but the, the nice thing about that particular species, that German black species, is that it was really hardy. You know, it it had acclimatized to the Alps and the mountainous regions and the colder climates. So when it was uh, brought to the colonies, it it did fine. Uh, it could handle those New England winters. Uh, so, you know, maybe if if they had tried to bring the Italian honeybee over uh, initially in the 1600s, it might not have naturalized quite so well. But but that's what the the specialists uh, seem to think at the time, because we did have some diversity of, of bee stock. And uh, many beekeepers imported other types of subspecies. You know, one was brought, a, a stock was brought in from, uh, I think, Cyprus. Um, several were brought over from, you know, other places. And it wasn't until 1922 um, with the trachea mite. And uh, imparting in such losses in Europe that the United States put the Honeybee Import Ban Act in place, and so yeah, so there was a lot. Ironically, there was a lot more diversity of honeybee species in the 19th century than there was in the 20th. Wow, I, I wouldn't have. Now that, that changed, either. mind you, because you know African honeybees ended up coming into the United States. Mm -hmm. you know, in 1990 through Texas. And I think some people even think that there may have been African honeybees that came into Florida through the ports. Um, But, but it's definitely documented that they showed up in the, in 1990 in Texas. So, you know, there have, you know, there have been some entrances, but um, yeah. And and what about, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's okay. Flag Go ahead. Is killing me. <laughs> and and what about a different um the societies of of the settlers? Could everybody have bees, or was that only limited to either like the upper or lower class? No, I mean, uh, in my study, it didn't seem as if it was um one it, it, as if it belonged to one particular social class. Um, many different, and again, we've already talked about the fact that women and men kept bees. Um, but it wasn't something like, you know, in England, um, you know, it was really considered an occupation of very learned, it, farming for intellectuals, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it was your learned, um, your convents, your monasteries, your universities, you know, those types of people. Um, but also peasants in Europe were very good beekeepers. I mean, this was how they would pay their tithes to the lords and the ladies and, and, um, and the convents and pay their taxes. So uh, it was a very much a 
a skill which transcended social class. And, and that carried over to the United States, the colonies before they became the states, but that carried over, that this was a skill that, it, that people would want to develop and certainly have on their, on their farms and their villages. And um, even Native Americans benefited from some of the, the byproducts, the value-added products of the hive, even though that wasn't part of their culture until 1622. Um, they certainly readily adapted it. So did the Native Americans become beekeepers as well? Not the way that you and I would think of, of them as beekeepers, but they you know, certainly made observations. I mean, you know, Thomas Jefferson is credited with saying that Native Americans called honeybees the white man's fly. Um, and there are some instances where, you know, they would certainly, especially as migration moved westward. And so, you know, honeybees um, took advantage of places like caves and things like that, especially in Texas. And so where they're building these kinds of caves and things, you know, it made for some, uh, some opportunities for, um, for different Native American groups to go in and harvest the beeswax and the honey. Yeah, there are, there are reports of that. But, you know, the kind of managed beekeeping that you're asking about, that's not something that we see, that I have found. I'm not saying that sure. it's not out there, but sure. it's not something that I've found. So as you've researched these so I, books and then um, your, your history in beekeeping and, and everything that you do, what have you found, in your opinion, is the most interesting about uh, honeybees and our culture or the evolution of beekeeping in North America? Hmm. So uh, now that I'm the state aviarist, you know, what I love about apiculture in North America is, A, um, you know, I take samples for the USDA, you know, because I want to establish a baseline of bee health um, for our state. And so that's the, that's my favorite part of the job is going out, taking samples, um, hearing the, about the beekeepers, either, you know, they're having a good year or what their struggles are. Uh, here in Kentucky, we have, we have a bear problem. And so, you know, it, it's, I, you know, it's not as if every sample I take is, is, you know, the beekeepers having a great year. There are real, there's, there are real problems. Um, but I like um, the complexity of establishing a, be, a, a baseline and working with beekeepers and trying to help figure out why their hives are dying. Um, to me, what's been compelling in the past year is to see how many viruses the apiaries in Kentucky have had, because of course, as a nation, we are suffering from this other virus as people. And so there's a lot of parallels between what I'm seeing happening in our community and what I'm seeing happening in the bee yard. So to me, that's very compelling. Um, I think some of the solutions could be the same. More space between hives may reduce horizontal transmission. <laughs> you know, <laughs> better hygienics with our hive tools, you know, <laughs> yeah. not using yeah. the same gloves over and over and over again, you know, not creating bacterial spread or, you know, viruses aren't bacteria. I, I know this, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, as, as we as a country get more educated on how we can be healthier, I think hopefully that that will trans over, uh, transfer to being better beekeepers too. You know, it's not such a big leap. Maybe that's what I love about the beehive is that there's so many parallels between the beehive society and the human society. Yeah, they, they really, they really are. <laughs> and like we talked at the beginning, a lot of lessons that can be learned as well. Well, Tammy, I mean, 
obviously there's a lot of information that we could talk about. I, I feel like I could talk to you for, <laughs> for many hours about the history of beekeeping. Um, but fortunately you have a book about it so that uh, folks can get all of the information there. Can you share with us um, your books? And sure. So, um, so Bees in America, um, of course you can find this at amazon.com, uh, Abe Books. Uh, that's just exactly like it sounds. abebooks.com uh, has used copies for a very reasonable rate. I like to make sure that people know about Abe Books because, um, like I said, it's a, it's a used bookstore and uh, I'm fond of them. So, um, so that's this one. This one came out in 2005. And I like to make sure that people understand that I was not a good beekeeper when I wrote this. I was I I really don't want people thinking that this is a how-to book. It is not. That is not who I was. I was an English professor and just fascinated with the symbol and how I felt like it defined our social patterns. Uh, my second book that came out um, is called Beconomy: What Women and Bees Teach Us About Local Trade and Global Market. I did not have a say in the subtitle. Um, but by this point, I had <laughs> gone to Hawaii and, and worked uh, with Big Island Queen for four different winters and in the queen industry. And also, um, you know, went to Australia to interview a queen producer there. Went to England to interview the grand dame of beekeeping, Eva Crane. Um, went to um, Australia. It, I, I traveled the world to write this one because I wanted to show the different types of hives as well as the different types of women who were keeping bees. So I'm very much of a beekeeper when I write this one. Sure. Um, so that's the difference between the two books. This one came out in 2012. And then I had been working with coal companies to establish uh, apiaries on surface mine sites in eastern Kentucky. So Larry Connor um, asked that I write a primer about that experience. And so the third book came out in 2019. It's called Flower Power, Establishing Pollinator Habitat. So I like to tell people it's a little like George Lucas in the Star Wars trilogy, except that I'm not making nearly the money that George Lucas did, but it's the past, present, and future. <laughs> Of beekeeping, uh, because I think that we do need to consider um, establishing more pollinator habitat, not just for honeybees, but also the native bees that exist in our in our country, and not just in our country, but in Mexico and Canada. Uh, so uh, that's the the third book is very much concerned with future practices. You know, I suspect that. What I would like to see, um, it's a pipe dream, but to have pollinator res you know, reservoirs, areas where um, we set aside uh, specifically to address those populations. Absolutely, that would, that would be wonderful. <laughs> and then for the, um, the state side, uh, as far as getting in contact with you, if somebody needs to have a hive inspected, um, do you have? Oh, so they just email me at tammy.potter at ky.gov. Oh, okay. You know, that's, you know, that's the email. And uh, typically, depending upon the year, I need a uh, time of year, I need about two weeks notice. Uh, that's, you know, if I'm at the state fair, I am okay. there at the state fair for two weeks. So, you know, sometimes the month of August is difficult, but yeah. Sure. Okay. And of course, we'll put the links to all of those in the show notes so that people don't have to try and frantically type as they listen here. Um, but Tammy, thank you so much for joining me today. I I learned a lot. This was really interesting. I wish I had about three more days to talk about <laughs> beekeeping with you. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. Thank you. And for those listening, thank you so much for joining me for another episode. And we'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.